Welcome to the Couch GM Podcast. You can find the full video version of this on YouTube, or you can find the audio only version on any major podcast platform. Today, I'm excited as I have on Tom Lampkin, who's a 13 plus year big league catcher, played across a few different teams, was on the 2001 Mariners when they won 116 games. He talks through some of the toughest pitchers that he's faced, some of the, the best pitchers that he's caught. He also goes through his experience in playing with teammates Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire, Deion Sanders, and much more. Before we get into it, I wanted to announce that I now have apparel that is live. You can visit the couchgm.snap.store. I'll also put the link in the description below so that you can pick up your gear. We have shirts, hats, you name it. We have the baseball logo and the football logo. So I appreciate your support in advance. Now let's get into the podcast. Cool. So another episode of the Couch GM podcast. Today I have on Tom Lampkin. So thank you for taking the time to sit down and chat with me today. Yeah, you bet. So let's just kind of start from the beginning. Um, kind of tell us who you are, where you came from, your childhood, how you got into baseball, that type of thing. <clears throat> well, um, I grew up, uh, I was born in Cincinnati, only spent a few years of my life there. Um, briefly, some time in Virginia, Northern Virginia, and then we moved out to uh, the Seattle area in Bellevue um, in back in the uh, in seventy two, and that's where I grew up. That's that was my those are my growing up years. Like we got there when I was about eight. Um, mom and dad and I've got uh, three younger brothers and an older sister, and uh, so we spent um, about twenty five thirty years there, and then um, uh, started you know playing playing baseball when I was younger. Played a lot of sports. My dad was was very active and in in, um, in coaching me and my brothers and uh, so football baseball and a couple of them, my brothers played basketball and and um, my sister was swimming and so there was always there was always sports going on in our house and um, my dad was you know coaching started with me because I was the oldest boy and and so he was he was always like I said he was he was always active um, in my life you know younger and then through high school and uh, yeah I went to high school at Blanchett High School in North Seattle and then um uh, went to Edmonds Community College for for my first year of college, and then went down to the University of Portland for my last three years, and that's kind of how I got into baseball. I, I don't know. I always I always um, always liked sports as you know as a kid uh, yeah. with three brothers, really close in age. It was always a a two on two matchup, so we, <laughs> we always had people to play with. You know, I've got two brothers, one older, one younger. I'm the middle child, so but I mean we were in sports active, so I can kind of you know, uh, relate to your story of, you know, you, for you guys, it was two on two for me. I had to defend myself and then I had yeah. to pick on my younger brother and you know, yeah. this dynamic, but, yeah. um, so you played multiple sports growing up. How did you get into baseball specifically? Well, um, you know, out of, out of high school, um, I, I had an opportunity to maybe go over to Eastern Washington and uh, and play baseball and maybe, maybe even try to play football. Uh, I don't know if, if that ever would have happened, but, um, you know, college football is a, is a different animal, you know, especially for somebody that, that wasn't very big like me. And so, um, so it, it was, even though it was probably my favorite sport, it was, it was something that realistically just wasn't going to happen. So, uh, so I ended up playing baseball and, and, you know, I, I was um, I was never you know a great player growing up like some guys. Um, I can remember playing as a kid against guys that just you know they just dominated. You thought they were you know they were going to go on and do something, but you know everybody kind of um, kind of matures at different rates. And and even now coaching high school baseball, the the time that I did, you really see that. Um, but but uh, nonetheless, I I you know after high school, I I went to college and and. And had some had a couple of pretty good years, and that's when I kind of realized that maybe, you know, maybe this might lead somewhere. And then when I got down to Portland, uh, a lot of the guys that had um, had had signed and were playing pro ball would come back in the off season to work out, and and uh, you know you start catching guys like that, um, the pitchers that would throw bullpens or or you know facing guys that would throw BP and hitting with guys that, you know, were in, you know, at the, in the minor leagues. And I was like, gosh, I, I think I could do this, you know? <laughs> so that's kind of where it, it starts. And then, you know, luckily at that time, University of Portland was, uh, um, was in the Pac-10. So it was a pretty, we had, we, had, we were in good competition. We had a lot of scouts living in that area. So it was a, um, it was a really 
heavily um, scouted area. You know, had a lot of eyes. Every game we had we had scouts there because, you know, they they were centrally located in Portland, and there were so many um, different leagues around the around the metro area and or the city of Portland. Really, that that scouts didn't have to go far to see teams mm-hmm. come into play. So, um, so it was good in that in that respect. I got a lot of I got a lot of looks, and you know. Uh, and then my senior year, I, I had a pretty good year and a good tournament over in, uh, I think it was over in Eastern Washington. And, um, you know, I was just fortunate that, uh, that, uh, that I got picked in, uh, in, in the June draft of 1986. So you go to the Cleveland Indians. Went to Cleveland. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I didn't get to Cleveland right away, but, um, yeah, yeah I started off in, uh, in Batavia, New York in the New York Penn league, which was a short season league. I don't. I don't think they have them anymore, but they might. I don't know. It's the the leagues right after the draft. You Is it like they, rookie ball, basically? Yeah, yeah, um, kind of like rookie ball. They uh, uh, they they start after the draft, which I guess rookie ball does. Um, so the majority of the guys on our team were the guys that were drafted that year. Uh, and I do remember um, a week or two into the season, uh, we had a couple guys that got sent down from one of our long A clubs. And, and then they released some guys that were on that Batavia team. But, um, yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was an eye-opening experience for me because, you know, I never, I never played with Latin American players. I didn't, you know, never. I, t- I took two years of Spanish in high school and two years in college so I could speak it a little bit. But, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, it's different when, you know, you got guys the you know, language barriers. next to you and, yeah. and, and they don't speak any English. So, yeah. Um, so it was different and I didn't know anybody and, you know, you're, you're, it's just, a, it's a different environment, but it was, um, it was good for me. And, and, um, I had a, a I had a couple guys on my coaching staff that were real good that kind of took me under their wing and helped me out. And, um, one guy in particular, Mike Hargrove had just retired from as a player. Um, and this is before he got to the managerial job he got in Cleveland, which is what he was getting into coaching for was to get that big league job. Um, and he was my hitting coach for two or three years and then, uh, well, for two years and then, um, uh, two seasons, I should say. And then, and then he was my manager the following, uh, f- my second full season in double a, um, I was there for half the season before I, I got called up, but yeah, that's kind of how my, my, my journey went. I was lucky. I was very fortunate that I didn't have to spend a lot of time in the minor leagues, at least not in the low minor leagues. I, bounced a little bit back and forth between triple a and the big leagues for you know about four years there in the in the early you know early 90s but um but i was fortunate there was a lot of guys that you know good players that uh just didn't catch breaks and i just i was one of them that did yeah so i guess walk me through that that minor league experience was it what, what you expected was it totally different from what you expected and then just the grind of you know working up through the minor leagues it sounds like you bounced back and forth for a few years yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah, it, it's different. I think the biggest the biggest difference was, I mean, you play every day. You, you play every day. Yeah. And, and back then, the minor leagues, I think we had maybe one day off every two or three weeks. I think it was. Uh, I don't even remember many off days at all. And and then that first season, that short season, you know, it's June, basically June, July, August. June, last half of June, July, August, maybe September. I can't, yeah, know the roster. So July, end of July. And then that was it. And, and I think we might've had two or three off days. So it was, they weren't many. And so that yeah. was, I think the biggest adjustment is you learn to, you know, you, you learn the, it's a, it's a, it's a different mindset, right? You don't play once or twice a week. You play, you play every day. So you're going to fail more, right? You're going to, you're going to have to deal with with that, along with the you know the the toll that it takes physically on you. Um, but those are things that that's what the minor leagues are for, you know. And there's a lot of um, especially position players that have to deal with that. Um, it's 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 there for a reason, and 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 you know I'm glad that I spent you know some time there, and I'm glad I didn't spend a lot of time there, but I'm glad I spent some time there. Um, but at the same time, I was like, I was, I was in pretty good shape back then. So um, the physical part of it wasn't as big of a deal for me. But you know, the mental um, approach, the failing stuff like that, um, you know, that that takes a little while to get used to. 
and luckily your coaching staffs, most of the coaching staffs, at least back then, were, were former players. And so um, it was great because they knew what it was like to struggle. So, yeah. um, so they, can, they can help you kind of through that part of it. But it's a grind, you know, and it was a small grind there at first. And then, um, you know, then I go to spring training the first year, my first, uh, so minor league spring training in 87. Uh, and that was eye opening because that was that was 150 or 160 guys in a small room with small lockers and you know. And you see some big uh, names in the same room and not not there. Okay. Um, all the big name guys were in big league spring training, okay. which is which is different. You know, I don't I don't know. Gotcha. Yeah. Some people don't know that. Some people think you go spring training and you know you're with you know all the big boys and you're not. Yeah. You know, there's. You got your forty-man roster guys, and your invited spring training guys, right? And you know this, but then you got your minor league side, which is, you know, one hundred and fifty or however many guys you got in minor league camp, and uh, you know it's it's cutthroat there. I remember, I remember coming into spring training about we were down at High Corbett Field down in um, Tucson, and I remember coming into that little it was a little I don't even know what it was called a little trailer almost like building they had there where the lockers were and. You'd come in sometimes, and the guy's locker next year's was cleaned out, and his uniform was hanging on the shelf, and his bags were on top of his locker. So, um, when it you know, <laughs> it was a business. You know, you yeah. learn that early, and and when you get to the big leagues, it's just as much or more of a business than the minor leagues. So, um, so you, you know, you you, you got to take that seriously. I mean, you're fighting for a job. You're fighting for a job when you get there. Most guys, at least, you're fighting for a job when you get there, and. You're fighting throughout the course of the year, and um, you know you learn to you learn to handle you know the failures, like I said, and the successes, and and you know you got to push through it. But but somehow the system seeds uh, seems to weed out the the you know the guys that don't belong there, and yeah, you know occasionally a guy will get traded and stuff like that. But for the most part, the, the system worked pretty good, and and the guys that belong there uh, in the big leagues got to the big leagues at some point. Um, but um, but for me, that was uh, that was a big deal. Spring, my first spring training, and then, and then I made the I made an A ball club. So there was, you know, then you have your long season A uh, A clubs after your short season A clubs, and so I was a uh, I was an eleventh round pick, and there was a tenth round pick um, out of Arkansas, um, who was also a catcher. Who who we he went to one club in, in the Carolina League, and I went to our team in the Midwest League. And in fact, I still talk to that guy. Um, almost I haven't talked to him in. in probably a few months but super super guy um turned out to be a scout for the diamondbacks uh, but he was a ended up being a just a just a solid guy and, and an influence in my life and um you know thank god he got put there when he did um and we spent a little bit of time together in batavia and then spring training and then at the end of my first full season uh in waterloo um the club in kinston got to the playoffs so i got called up to to go play with him again in kinston and um was that double A? That or? was the that was another A ball club. Okay. So um, maybe high A. Or something yeah, it like was. That. A, they they actually were in a better league than we were. Um, so I got called up to play on that team, and then and then we both went to spring training next year, which was my my our second spring training, and we both went to double A, which was in uh, Williamsport at that time, in the New York Penn Le- or in the uh, in the um, Eastern League, and so. Uh, I was I was fortunate again that I didn't have to go to a, a, a league where the, the bus rides were were really long because yeah. I was fortunate Midwest League was six hours and you know the New York Penn League was four or five hours and now the Eastern League's five or six hours so it was it was lucky and I I, I had a good a good start and um, uh, I remember I, I made the All Star team and I remember I was in Harrisburg for the All Star game and I got a, a phone call from um, from one of the guys in the front office and said that. Um, that I was getting called with AAA because our, our big league catcher at that time, who was Andy Allenson, um, got hurt. And so they called the AAA guy up to the big leagues, and they called me up to AAA. So um, I got on a plane, flew to Colorado Springs, and um, that was, uh, you know, again, that now now it's a little different because you're playing with guys that have been to the big leagues. And yeah. now I'm playing with guys that I, I used to watch on TV, some of them. I remember yeah. Jeff Dedman who pitched for the Braves was on that team and Donnie Lovell, a local guy was on that team. And, um, you know, some other guys that, you know, Rod Allen guys who had some big league time and, uh, you know, I, it's, it, it happened pretty quick for me. So, 
Um, so I didn't, I, I, when I, when I sit and reflect on it now, it seems like I probably could have gotten caught up in it a lot more, but at that time I was, you know, you're just focused on getting to the big leagues. So, um, so those were, those were good times in Colorado Springs. It, it's a great hitters park cause the ball just flew out of there. Altitude. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was tough to catch in, but it was great to hit in. And uh, how, how far away is that from, uh, Denver? Um, you know, I, I, it's about an hour. It's okay. not far. You know, it's where the Air Force Academy's there, and um, I mean, it, might, it, it was about an hour, if I remember right. But NORAD was there, and so there was a lot of cool things that we could do, and you know, to you know, take up some time. But a couple more off days there. But it was a brand new stadium, so it was it was it was fun. That was a it was a good place to play, Triple A baseball, and and the PCL is a great league. At that time, it was, you know, they had. Um, they had five teams in the north and five in the south, but you know, I mean, it was Phoenix and Vegas, Albuquerque, Tucson, and us. I mean, those are you know pretty good cities. And then you, know, you had Calgary and Edmonton and Vancouver, Portland, Tacoma. So I got to go home when we go to Portland, Tacoma. So the, that was good. Um, that was fun, and and I did well while I was there. And so um, when the rosters expanded in September, they called me up to the big leagues that year. So. Um, I, again, I was very fortunate that things worked out the way they did, and I didn't have to spend a ton of time down there. And so then when I go to spring training the following year, um, I think I was in big league camp that year because that was my second year on the roster. I, they had to put me back on the roster at the start of spring training that year, so two-year roster players got to go, got an invite to spring training, so I was in spring training, which is, again, totally different than minor league camp. You know, you got bigger lockers, there's less people, yeah. it's, you know, more, food better food to eat. Yeah. Better, yeah. <laughs> Everything's better. Um, and you didn't debut that prior year. I did. Um, yeah. So I got called up um, in September. Oh, yeah. I uh, I flew uh, me. It was me and Jay Bell, uh, a guy named Rod Allen, who does a lot of radio stuff for the Diamondbacks, at least he used to. I don't know if he still does. Big first baseman. And a guy named Eddie Williams, who was uh, – I want to say he was uh, he was a first rounder for the Reds, maybe in um, oh gosh, year year or two before me, or right around my time. Anyway, I think I, somehow we got him in a trade. But um, so Steve Swisher was my manager in in AAA, and he called us in the office the last day in Tucson and said, "Hey, you guys are you guys are going up with the rosters expanding, and you got to get on a plane tomorrow to New York City." And the wow. team was in in town playing the Yankees, so that was my that was my <laughs> what first, first first game. Yeah, exposures. Yeah, and it, and that was cool. Um, yeah, I'll never forget that. I remember the whole day, and uh, I just, you know I I I'd, I'd never really other than the the Kingdom, which when I was a kid I you know I worked a little bit there for the Mariners, so I was in the you know the locker room when you know and was like a little ball boy and stuff when I was back in high school. Um, so I'd been to the to that stadium and you know been out on the field, but I never you know never played in a big league club, a uh, big league stadium other than sp- some spring training games. But yeah, that was a that was a that was a shock. Um, I probably couldn't have played that day anyway. I was just you know, <laughs> just looking at everything. Yeah. And, um, and then we went. Uh, so we spent three days there, and then went to Boston. Um, and I did I did get a, uh, an appearance there. That was my first one. We were. Um, I'll never forget the uh, Clemens was he had a five hit shutout against us in um, in the eighth through eight innings and I I had or through set through our half of the eighth and then I came in in the bottom of the eighth and caught the bottom of the eighth because you know we probably weren't going to hit in the ninth they weren't going to hit in the ninth and I remember I was out in the bullpen and I had to I had to run across the field and go back up and get my gear and then get in the game and I got one pitch warm up pitch by the time I got my stuff on and then, <laughs> you know. And then the, then the, then the, you know, the game was underway, but it was, that was a, that was just a, I was just so nervous. I, I can't even tell you how nervous. And, so to clarify, and you I, were going against Roger Clemens? He was pitching that day, but, uh, but I came in to catch. And so, um, Don Gordon was our pitcher. So I had to, I had to, I was catching that day. So I ran up, you know, to the plate after I got my gear on and caught the bottom of the ninth. Okay. And then gotcha. at the top of the ninth, I, we didn't, we didn't, I didn't hit that inning got you they probably made sure of that but um and then we went to uh i think we went to to uh toronto after that and then uh, or toronto detroit were a couple places and then i got a couple more at bats in um uh in cleveland um that year i think i only had four and 
two two or three appearances was all but it was enough you know back then it was just to get some of the butterflies out like yeah okay. yeah and and you need to yeah <laughs> at least with me you know i mean that, that was something i've wanted to do my whole life and you know it, um, all of a sudden now you're doing it and you're in you know i mean I remember warming up in Yankee Stadium and, you know, Dave Winfield and Don Mattingly and Willie Randolph and, you know, and all these guys are coming over and shaking hands with guys on our team, you know, and we're warming up. And, I, you know, I just – it was just like this is, you know, I can't believe this I is I should happening. be getting autographs right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it just, you know, two years ago, I three – two and a half years ago, I was watching them, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's weird. It, it was weird, but, you know, you, you get used to it like anything, you know, and, and um, you know, you, uh, you start hanging out with those guys and you realize that they're, you know, they're good, but they're, they're guys too. And, yeah. um, you know, there were some, I got to play with some good players that first year. And in fact, I ended up, uh, Joe Carter was on that team in, in Cleveland and I ended up playing with him in, in, in San Diego. Um, a couple of years later, I got traded to San Diego and he was on that team there and, there were a couple other guys that I ended up playing with or playing against. I played with Bud Black, who was on that team um, in Cleveland. Um, and uh, anyway, just just you know, just great guys. I it, it, they turned out to be some good guys. So good experience. But um, but I, yeah, I'm glad I got in to, to get my feet wet because it, yeah, it, uh, you, I think everybody needs to do that at once. There are definitely some jitters in there. Yeah. So. Uh... First off, do you remember your? Of course, you remember your first big league home run. I do. Yeah, that my. When was uh, that? What was that like? I don't remember the date, but I can tell you it was in 1990. We were. Um, I was playing for San Diego, uh, and we had um, we we were we were at home, and we were playing Houston, and um, I, I can't remember if I started that game. I think I did. And um, I just remember hearing about Mike Scott and, you know, he was, uh, uh, he had won the Cy Young either the year before or two years ago or something. And, um, you know, I heard he, you know, he maybe did some stuff to the ball to make it move. I don't know. Some everybody's, sticky stuff. Everybody's got their, <laughs> their things that they say. But, um, but I, I do remember um, uh, I hit my first home run against him and I, I don't remember what the count was. And I ended up getting the ball back. Um, which was kind of cool, but, uh, but anyway, it was, it was, I do remember it was neat. It bounced up into the, into the bleachers and then came back down onto the field. There you go. But that was my first. And, um, yeah, I remember, I remember, I remember a lot. I remember a lot of them. I didn't have many of them. So I, I guess <laughs> I do remember some of them. That was one of them. There you go. So, uh, you bounced around for a few years, my, uh, minor leagues to the major leagues. It sounds like you got traded and then you became a regular at that point. So, yeah, I got, um, my fr- I got traded to Cleveland in in ninety um, yeah in, in ninety I was in AAA at the time I had gotten hurt in in eighty nine I tore ligaments in my thumb in a freak accident when I was catching and so I was out for two and a half months I came back in ninety I did not make the club I was probably a little upset that I didn't um, and uh, and I got traded to San Diego uh, and at that time the when the time of the trade it was over the All Star break, and the big league club was in Pittsburgh, so I remember Jack McKeon called me and and uh, and asked me if I could get to Pittsburgh by you know Tuesday, and I said yeah I I can get on a plane right now. <laughs> I was I was playing golf in Colorado Springs at that time. There you go. And so um, I, I jumped on a plane and flew to Pittsburgh and. Um, I don't think I got in that day, but I was in, I got in pretty quick. Um, uh, Benito Santiago, who was a catcher at the time, had just, um, just broke his arm. He got hit with a pitch and broke his hand. And so, um, Mark Parent was catching. And so they wanted somebody to help out Mark. So they, they got me in a trade and I got traded for Alex Cole and went over to, uh, to, uh, San Diego and caught, and I, I, you know, I didn't didn't swing the bat that well over there, um, but I caught, I, you know, I was a catcher and a catch and throw guy anyway. I wasn't not a great hitter, but, um, but I did that and then uh, uh, made the club in '91 and 
um, got sent down in 92, got traded to Milwaukee in 93. I was, I was in Milwaukee just about all year. I missed the first couple weeks. But it was in Milwaukee that I learned how to hit. That's, that's where – that was the biggest – you know, and I, and I and I know sometimes people ask me that when I'm um, if I'm talking about hitting or something. You know, who who was really a big influence? I remember when I went to Mill. I was always kind of a, just a slap hitter. You know, mm-hmm. I I didn't like to strike out, and I could run a little bit. So, you know, if I could just put the ball on the ground, I had a chance to get on base. But you know, when you get older, especially when you're when you're at that level, and you know, you got other guys that are, are good players that. I got to do something to make myself stand out a little bit. And, right. and that, and the way I was hitting was not one of them. And, um, if I wanted to play, I was going to have to do something, you know, significant when I got in the game. So, um, I remember once we were taking extra BP and we were in Milwaukee and I was hitting with, uh, Kevin Reimer, John Jaha was there. I think BJ Surhoff was in that group. And there was a couple other guys we were hitting early. And I remember Kevin, just looking at me and he said some things that I I'm probably won't say here on the thing, but he, he, he kind of was asking me if I, if that's all I could do is so I was like, you know, is that all you can do? You know, and I'm like, I, you know, I never, I never really, never really, you know, thought about, it. I mean, I've always been this kind of hitter and he's like, can you hit the ball out of the park? And I said, I don't know, you know, yeah. maybe, I don't know. So I literally that day, my stance changed, my approach changed, my, um, my attitude changed and I realized that at that time that I could, I was actually strong enough to hit the ball out of the park. And I, I didn't have, you know, a lot of home runs that year, but it, it totally changed the way I hit. It was, changed everything about my approach. Was it a launch angle thing? Um, it, it was, um, it was, it was focusing on swinging at a pitch that I knew that I could handle. Right. So I'll give you an example. This is what I tell kids. I was telling my high school kids this. And I talked to when I talked to hitting them, this is what I talk about. If you never, I mean, if you, if I want to see a round where you try to hit the ball out of the ballpark, I want, I want to see you do that. I want you to hit the ball out of the park. And then you'll start to realize after 20, 30, 40 swings, two days or whatever, what pitches you can hit out and what you can't. There are some guys that take that pitch down and away and can take it to left center. There are some guys that, that can't. You know, there's other guys that hit the pitch up and in, and they can pull it and turn on it. There's other guys that they get jammed. Mm-hmm. So you got to know what pitch you can hit. And the only way you're going to know that is to try it. Mm-hmm. And, and it seems pretty basic, but I never did that. You know, I never even tried it. So um, I would say that that was the first The first concept was recognizing what pitch I, I could hit I could hit out and what, pitch, what pitches I couldn't. So when you get into counts where – you know, you think you're going to get those types of pitches, then you look in areas, you look in zones, and then that's, you get ready to hit it, yep. you know, and if it's there, then I have a good opportunity to, you know, to hit that pitch. And so it, it forces you to, um, to try to come, you know, try to watch the ball come back a little bit more. It, it, it forces you to try to um, think counts a little bit more instead of just go up there with not much of a plan. Yeah. Just, I'm just going to make contact. Um kind of it made me a smarter hitter and then and then you know and 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 two the more you get into it with with pitching coaches and I was a catcher so I learned pitching side of it and and then you start learning the game more the the more you're in it and and you know hopefully you know you you know your your baseball IQ goes up and so um even though I might not have been a really good hitter I knew a lot about hitting you know and so I could I could I could teach it um and I could explain it uh, and, and sometimes I could even do it, but, um, that's when, that's when hitting changed for me it was in 92, it was in 93. Uh, so then I got, um, I, I was non-tendered. So I signed a free agent contract with, uh, with the giants in 94. And I thought I was going to make the team in 94 and I didn't. So I was, once again, I was upset. So I went back to AAA at that, there, there, we were in Phoenix there. And I had a good year. I think I hit eight homers that year and 300 and something at bats, which for me was good. I mean, I'd, I'd never even dreamed I'd hit that many. Um, but again, I learned, I was learning how to hit. And so uh, I made the club in, in, in spring training in 94, and I was in the big leagues from then on out. And I, I, there's no doubt about it that one of the main reasons that, hap- that happened was because I learned how to hit. 
And you learned how to hit home runs, it sounds like. Well, yeah, I mean, I wasn't a home run hitter, but... From that mindset change, it turned into extra base hits or yeah, into it, more production. It, it, what it turned into was it turned into me all of a sudden um, being a guy that that when I came up, they had to at least think about me. Yeah, You know, when I was catching, you know, there were a couple different types of hitters. There was a guy that could hurt you and a guy that couldn't. You know, when, when a guy came up that couldn't hurt you, we're coming at him. Just come at him. Fastballs. Yeah. or whatever the fill, strikes fill, fill it up yeah. yeah i mean you don't you don't want to walk guys like that because they're not going to hurt you mm-hmm. but if you got a guy that can hurt you now all of a sudden you got to you got to pitch to him especially with guys on you know or you know if you don't have an open base or you know it it would it would the game would would dictate whether or not you pitch to a guy but so would the fact that the guy could hit one out of the park or if he couldn't you know right. so I became, I kind of went into that other group when I learned how to do that. Now all of a sudden you just couldn't lay a fastball into me. I mean, I could, I, I could hit it. I could hit it out. Whereas some guys, they'll never, they never did that. So I, that was definitely one of the reasons that um, I think my career changed paths a little bit. And I still, like I said, wasn't a, you know, never a big home run hitter, but, but you get pitched a little bit differently when you, when you, when you can show that you got enough power to hit the ball out of the park. And was it also a matter of like packing on weight type thing to where that, um, that also helped? Yeah, probably. I got stronger and, and, um, you know, you, you start, you know, technology kind of comes along the longer you're in the game and you start doing different, different stuff, trying different things. And, you know, uh, I was always, um, kind of in weights, so, uh, that was nothing new to me, but different exercises, you know, uh, medicine ball, you know, the heavy balls, those types yeah. of things were big in the nineties, eighties and nineties and, you know, tubing and it all, it's just, you know, different types of forearm stuff was all, um, kind of came, you know, I might've been in back then, but I, I really got into it more in the early nineties, but, um, but yeah, you start getting a little bit bigger and then you get older and you get bigger, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I was I was pretty fortunate. I, I most of my weight was pretty much good most of my career. But um, yeah, I, I think more more than anything, it just you, you learn you learn how to hit. You know, you yeah. you you talk to guys that were good hitters, and you know, I would be. I guess I I, I kind of have to tell, tell you when I was in San Diego in in ninety last half of ninety and ninety one, Tony Gwynn was on that team, wow. and I can remember. You know, I mean, I used to watch him hit when I was younger, but I. I, and when I when I when I was on his team, I used to just watch him, you know, and and I would ask him why he's doing what he's doing, and and I can remember going up to the to the cage on the second story there, the second floor um, of old Jack Murphy, and hitting off a tee with him every day for hours, and he would just put the ball on the tee for me, and again, and you know, he would tell t- talk to me about why we're doing this, and. This is what this is forcing you to do, and this is why I do this. And and then it got to be so helpful for me that when I went to San Francisco and we would come as, as a visiting player, I would I would come into the clubhouse. Those guys were still working there. You know, all mm-hmm. the clubhouse staff was still there. Yeah. So I would come in and in my giant stuff, and I would just walk up <laughs> and sit next to Tony in his locker, and we would just talk and – and then we'd go up to the cage and we'd hit together. He'd put a ball on a tee for you. He'd, and he'd feed me and then I'd feed him. And I could remember him seeing me come in at 1 or 12.30 in the afternoon. And he'd go, oh, Lambie, sit down, <laughs> man. And he'd sit down. And he goes, what are you doing wrong now? Oh, uh, man. He was great. He was such a oh, – he was a great hitter. He's a great hitter. He's a great teacher. You know, there was a lot of good hitters but that couldn't teach hitting and – Guys that you know knew hitting but couldn't do it, but he he was good at both. He was really good. And I played with a lot of guys that, not like that, but I played with a lot of guys. Edgar Martinez was one, you know, mm-hmm. you know, you know, even Brett Boone was was one in Seattle. And I mean, there were so many. A Rod was good. And Junior, of course, was good. But those guys, I mean, they talk hitting, you know, and it was great. I mean. Yeah, really, you know, there were so many. There were so many guys in my career that were like that. Phil Nevin was was good. It was just a David Bell I and mean, guys that were you know just students of hitting and studied hitting and uh, it was it was good. You learn from guys like that, man. You'd be stupid if you didn't. And yeah, it's just you know taking it in and hearing just as much as you could, you can 
here or just asking questions. Yeah. Um, so yeah, getting into your time in Seattle. So you go from the Giants to the Cardinals for a couple of years, and then you go to Seattle in '99. Yeah. So walk us through what that was like at that yeah, point. Yeah, I remember. Um, so coming out of St. Louis was was you know so '98 was the year McGuire hit all those homers and and that was oh man okay. that was that was the most I, that that was probably the most incredible year that I was a part of. I'm, the the 200 and 201 or 2001 Mariners was was another one but the year that McGuire hit those homers was was a year like you, you just couldn't even imagine how electric that year was everywhere we went it was it was amazing and that was the race with Sosa was that yeah. that year okay yeah and it, it was just incredible I mean I could fill up an hour show just talking about that <laughs> and what that was like but I mean I, I didn't I, I thought I was going to go back. I thought I, I thought in '99 I was going to resign with them, and and it didn't happen. So I remember being at home and I got a call from my agent, and he said, "Hey, I think Seattle is interested." And I was like, "Okay." I, I mean, that would be my number one choice, right? Because I was living in Vancouver at the time, and you know, I grew up in Bellevue, so I used to work for the Mariners. I'm like, "This is this would be perfect." Mm-hmm. You know, I'm getting later in my career now and I'd, I'd love to finish there so um, we were able to to get a two-year contract with the Mariners in 99 so I was fired up to to go there I mean that was that was that was great you know that would that was just kind of the icing on the cake for me had a young team really good team yeah they were good um, they they weren't young really they were um, you know that they had Buner Edgar um, John Olru, Dan Wilson, Norm Charlton. I mean, there was, I think Norm was on that 99 team. There might have been some, Jamie Moyer was on that team. There might, there might have been some younger guys. I remember a bunch of older guys, but that's probably because I was older. But there might have been some younger guys on that team. Um, but, but they were good. I mean, they were good. They were moving from the Kingdom um, after the first half into Safeco. And uh, it was just, it was a great situation. I mean, that was such a great year for me. It was so fun to be back home and, um, you know, play in front of guys that, uh, you know, I mean, Henry Gonzalez, the clubhouse manager, was a clubhouse manager when I was working there as a 14 year old, <laughs> you know. So, uh, and there was a couple other people there that were there when I was working there. Um, and then I would have people that I went to high school with come down and yell at me from the you know from the, <laughs> the stands so that'd be cool to play in your hometown like that yeah it was cool i remember doing a um i remember uh, with one of the local stations up there doing a walk through uh my old high school um it was it was it was neat to see well i hadn't been back in so long i i never went to any reunions because i was always playing in the summer yeah. so i never could really go back to school so uh, it was kind of cool to go back there and walk through that and see some of the old teachers and and the old quads and locker rooms. But yeah, those were those were those were fun and we won there. You know, we we had good teams in Seattle in those three years and um, they were in the playoffs a couple times. We won all the games in '01. So um, so those were great years, great guys, great coaching staff. I mean, it was those that was a that was a how was that was team d- dynamic. Remember specifically in like 2001 116 wins yeah it was good it was um it was good you know i remember um i remember just just day to day you know being on the bench during the games whether i was playing or not and you know it would just if we were down it'd just be like okay you know you know okay we you know somebody's gonna have to do something to win this game because we're gonna win and we we knew (laughs) we were gonna win and, and everybody knew we were gonna win and, and they, they knew we were going to win, you know. And it was kind of like when I was playing in St. Louis, I tell people, you know, the, the opposing team knew that Mac was going to homer. They knew it. <laughs> and, and the pitchers that were pitching knew he was going to homer. That, that everybody did. Everybody thought it. Everybody knew it. And when you're, when you're, when you're playing under those, you know, with that mindset. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to happen, you know. Yeah. Or at least it, it, it's – it's going to repeat. It's it's going to happen every once in a while. I mean, you don't you can't play the game thinking you're going to lose, or you can't play the game thinking you're going to make an out. You know, you you have to. 
it's what I tell people. You have to convince yourself that you are better than you are, you know, and you can do that. Bonds was the best at that. He was the, he was the best head, uh, you know, mind player, at least in, uh, offensively, I think, that I ever played with. I mean, he was – and he could hit, don't get me wrong. He was – for three or four years, he was – I'd never seen anybody hit like that. But I can remember him when I was playing with him and, and sitting on the bench with him and listening to him and just the confidence that he had. And he was able to create um, – something in him that would just make him better than he was. And it, whether it was way he talked to himself or what he thought about himself, but that's the competitive advantage that athletes need to have in order to be good. Some guys do it really well. Some guys don't. But if you want to be good, if you want to get to whatever it is, the top of whatever you do, you have to convince yourself that you're better than you are. Confidence. You have to motivate yourself you have to you hear Dion say it and on when he's if you're watching any of his stuff you gotta you gotta motivate you gotta find something to motivate you and which and I played with him too by the way and Dion in, Sanders in in uh, San Francisco the second half of 95 when he came over just just played with him for that half a year because he was only there for half a year but um, but again another self-motivator you know you look at these guys junior Alex Edgar Mark McGuire, when he was hitting those, Barry, especially. I mean, all of all the good ones. Matt Williams. I could go down the line. Robin Yount, when I played with Robbie his last year. Um, there, there were so many, but they're all good motivators. They're all self motivators. They're all, they all convince themselves that that they are good. You know what I mean? And and you're just likely to repeat those things when you when you can do that. And. You know, the more you talk to guys like that, the more time you spend with the, with guys like that. You were mentioning the time in Seattle. You start to believe that, you know, and we believed as a group that we were going to win every game. You know, we believed that if we were down in the eighth or ninth, somebody was going to do something to turn the game around, yeah. you know, and, and I think the other team knew that. And that's one of the reasons why we, we had such a good year that year. Did you see similarities between McGuire, Bonds, all these guys with their uh... – leading up to the game that they were doing certain things to get into that mindset or was it just a deep in like you know inward thing that's kind of who they are or they shape themselves to become that person or is it like a um you know before a game thing that where they get into a mindset yeah i know with mark um he did a lot of um like a, I, I don't know I, I don't i don't want to use the word meditation because i don't want to say that that's what he did if he if he doesn't call it that but he did some um, quiet time with himself before games. Um, Barry, not so much. Barry was, he was always in his locker doing other stuff, you know, working on his, taping his bat or doing whatever he was doing. I don't recall him doing that. I think with Barry, it was different. Barry just, he, he would, he, I, it was just his whole, his whole attitude and approach was, was, I don't know if it was just a, um, it's what he did to, to keep himself, you know, in, in being such a good player. I, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I couldn't do it, but <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I try to, you know, try, you try to, I mean, I can self-motivate and there's no doubt about that, but Barry just had this way of, of convincing him and people around him that he was that good. And so those types of guys, they just weren't affected as much by the failure as other people. Yeah, they handled it very well. Yeah. You know, I did not handle failure at least not early in my career. I, I was I was hothead. I didn't I didn't like to fail, but um, you can't you can't let it bother you the way I was letting it bother you. And you learn when you get older around these guys that are a lot better than you, that have been around there a lot more than you, that. Um, that are more successful than you, that you, you kind of watch them. And you're like, oh, well, maybe I should try doing it that way, <laughs> you know? And, and, and so if you can, if, as long as your pride doesn't get in the way and you can go ahead and do that, then I think there, that makes you a better player. There's not a lot of guys that I remember playing against or with that lost their cool and their temper all the time. I, I can't even remember. I mean, I remember incidents here and there, um, but for the most part, you better learn how to fail because you're going to do it a lot, you know. But 
but guys like that, they would just, there was something about them that, you know, junior was the same way. All the, all the real good players were like that. You know, they just, they took it in stride and they, they somehow got themselves back in their next at bat and, you know, they didn't let it bother them. Um, but yeah, the, uh, there, there were a lot of guys, there were a lot of guys like that. I'm just, I'm not just mentioning a few, but there were a lot of guys like that that were. That's incredible that you had the opportunity to play with some of the greatest players of all time. Yeah. Mark McGuire, Barry Bonds. I mean. Yeah. And I, and you know, people ask me that too, you know, who was your favorite player and who, you know, who, who do you get to, you know, the play with? And, and I was so fortunate. I, I believe that I played in an era that, you know, I, I believe the baseball was a great game back then. You know, it still is. But when I look at the players back then, and, and here's how I qualify that: there was a, there's a lot of Hall of Famers in that from you know the mid '80s to you know early 2000s. A lot. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, you know, I have I've only been out of the game for 20 years, so it's only been what 10, 15 years that people have been eligible. But I mean, there's some there's a lot of Hall of Famers on that list, you know, that I played that I got to play with. And the cool thing about that, and I was thinking about that on the way over here, is you know to be able to to tell people stories that, that I have with some of these guys, and and it's it's passing on things that I learned from them, whether it's you know from you know from Barry or from from Mark or from you know from Tony or Edgar, or, you know. Kevin Reimer, even, I mean, I, 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 I just got so much, you know, I learned so much from the guys that I played with <clears throat> that, um, that's, that's, that was cool, you know? And I mean, a lot of these guys are hall of famers. I, I mean, you know, I, I think Bond should be in the hall of fame. I think the player should be in the hall of fame. Um, you know, they, there's, and there's so many other guys that I played with that either are going to go there or, 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 um, are there now. And, and a lot of guys that I played against. You know, Roger Clemens, Clemens, one. yep, Clemens. You know, Mariano Rivera. I, I mean, there, there's so many. I, I, there's so many guys that I, I mean. You just look at the guys that played from you know '88 to 2002, and there's a ton of a ton of guys. And if you played during that time, I either played against you or played with you, because <laughs> I was on you know six or seven different clubs and played in uh, played in both leagues. I think interleague play came in and. 97 or 98 one of those two years i think and so then then you really got to play against everybody after that so <clears throat> memorable guys that you've caught memorable guys that you've faced are there you know a handful of people that you faced or caught that really sit with you um yeah i remember um yeah well i would say that the guys that i faced um, early in my career, you know, I was a left-hander, you know, hit left hand. So come off the bench, I got to face a lot, or I should say I had to face a lot of right-handers, um, closers. Um, so you, you saw the cutter? Yeah, the cutter wasn't as big back then, is it? it cutter came in probably um, intentionally, I should say, came in probably later in my career, late in the 90s. It's people, they start throwing that cutter more. Um, it's like the split finger kind of came in with Roger Craig in the early 90s. The cutter came in in the late 90s. Um, guys, the pitching pitching has changed a lot from when I first came in to when it, where it is now. Um, there was uh, a lot of guys didn't throw back foot sliders, you know, um, in like a right hander into a left hander. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that came in later in my career, and I'm glad it did because I, I would have never hit like <laughs> if, if that would have been big in the early '90s. But um, the guys that I faced that really stand out, I would say that the the toughest pitcher that I faced, um, pitcher thrower guy who just had great stuff, almost hands down would have been Pedro Martinez. He Pedro, was, he was electric. Yeah. That guy had unbelievable stuff. That I, fastball I would, changeup combo. Pat fastball changeup sinker four seamer curveball <laughs> curveball yeah i mean he was and he'd throw any pitch anytime i remember when we when we <clears throat> when i was in triple a he was with the dodgers and um he was in albuquerque and I, I i had two homers off him in albuquerque during that season and both fastballs and when i got to the big leagues i didn't see a fastball from him so <laughs> he i think i went over 30 something against him. <laughs> i didn't get a hit off him in the big leagues i hit a couple balls Man. good but wow yeah i had no chance 
back then he was throwing curveballs, change-ups. I, I, he threw me 2-0 breaking balls, and, and he would be laughing, I remember. <laughs> but he, he just – because he wasn't going to give me a heater anymore, and I wasn't going to let him beat me with that. But, and so he just never gave it to me because he could throw everything else for strikes anyway, and his change-up looked like a fastball, and his sinker looked like a fast – I mean, everything was – he was electric. Maddox, of course, was another one who had just great command. His ball moved all over the place. Didn't throw quite as hard as Pedro, but um, but hard enough to keep you off balance. I'd say those two guys, those two guys were just, I, they gave me the most problems of anybody. The, the, those two guys were. The difference between those two was Maddox. I always felt like I was going to get a hit when I went up there. I never did, but I felt like I was going to. <laughs> yeah. Pedro, I knew I wasn't going to. Yeah. The result was the same either way, but. Those two guys, I would say, were, were the best that I faced, and then, uh, or they gave me the most problems. Did you ever face Randy? I did. I faced Randy. Um, I had six at bats against him. Um, lefty on lefty against. Yeah, the unit. I, 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 and I remember those two. I, my first, my first, uh, first time I faced him, I was in Milwaukee, and um, I'd be careful how I word these. So we were in <laughs> Milwaukee. And I'd come into we come into Seattle to play the Mariners in '93, and um, Randy had he was just getting his command kind of under control. You know, he's still a little wild, effectively wild, but yeah. you know he's um, he was pitching. You know, he could pitch. Um, and Dave Nilsson was our catcher in in Milwaukee. He was our everyday guy. And then we had a guy named Joe Kamak who um, who was a right hander. And then then there was me. Um, I played. I, I played. Even played a little outfield that year. But anyway, so uh, so I don't know, something happened with Dave Nelson that day. He didn't. He couldn't catch for one reason or another. I, I don't know why. <laughs> My but, back hurts. I can't. <laughs> yeah. So so Gar came up. To, Phil Garner was our manager, and he said, "He goes, Lamp. I, I hate to do this, man, but you're in there. You're in there today." And I said, "All right. You know, that's fine." So, you know, needless to say, I, I you know, I'm, I'm. I haven't had a lot of at bats that year anyway because Dave was catching most of the time, and and so the guys on the team were kind of pulling for me, you know, because they knew that it was kind of a bad situation <laughs> yeah. for a left-hander to go in there. And um, I remember I was like, okay, you know, he's he he he, he throws hard, right? He's a, he's he's a fastball slider guy. He's not going to dick around with me. He doesn't want to hit me because if he hits me, then I'm on, and he and he should be able to get me out. So he's he's not going to hit me. So I just said I'm just going to sit on something hard and you know try to get the head out no, that's that's all I really could do so I remember the first pitch he threw me a fastball first pitch and I hit a like a one hop ground ball down first baseline and it was about two feet foul and I, I said <laughs> okay that was my shot yeah and then uh he ended up uh he I ended up going three and two and um I remember Eric Gregg was umpire and, and he called uh he called a strike three on a ball that was that was outside on me I know it was outside I know it was outside because I know the strike zone, right? And I, I'm a catcher. I know when a pitch is outside, it was outside. Right. And I turned around, and I was so – I mean, I had gotten the count back to full, and I was I, I was so – you know, you get you, just, you get so amped when in certain yeah. situations that it was just a letdown when he called me out. So I turned around and just yelled in frustration, not at him, but I just yelled something at him, and T took his mask off and – I turn around and kind of start to walk towards dugout, and I, I look, and the guys on my dugout are kind of starting to walk out it, and they're yelling it at Randy, and I'm like, I, you know, oh, at Randy, know, at Randy. <laughs> well, apparently Randy was yelling at me, and so my guys started yelling at him, and I didn't hear anything because you know, in the kingdom you couldn't hear anything. So then I turned around and said some things, and anyway, it was, um, uh, you know, it was just it was one of those deals. The guys on that team, I think, I think. We, we brawled eight times that year, wow. our team. And, and I think our manager started just about all of them. Oh, yeah? Scrap, yeah. Uh, uh, Garner was a little scrapper, and he, he <laughs> didn't take crap from anybody. So um, anyway, it wasn't – it wouldn't surprise me that guys on our team started yelling. And so anyway, my next couple of bats, um, I think I struck out both my next two at bats against him. So I was I ended up being over 3 that first day. He beat us. And I remember going into the dug uh, into Gar's office afterward. I was so I was so pissed at the way that game went. 
I walked into Gar's office and I said, if we play them in five days and he's pitching, I want to catch that game. And Gar said, you got it. So five days later, they're in Milwaukee wow. and he's pitching and I'm catching. So I'm like, okay, I, I got a plan now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Don't know if it was going to work, but um, I, I at least had an idea. I, I know there were some things I had going for me. He didn't want to hit me. So I knew I could get up on the plate. And if he hit me, big deal. You know, mm-hmm. as long as he didn't, you know, hit me in the face, it didn't, it wasn't As long as it, did, as it didn't break a bone yeah, or something like but that. But, you, you know, he, if you turn right, it's not going to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I got hit by some, you know, guys throwing hard. And it, if, if you get hit in the right spot. It, There's the meat there. Yeah. So, but he didn't want to hit me, you know, because he, he, he's going to, he expects to get me out. So I remember my, I could walk through it. I'm not going to, I, but I will tell you that I hit a, I hit a, a line drive to left center that junior robbed me of an extra base hit on. And then I hit a ground ball up the middle that Rod picked up and threw me out at first on, and then he struck me out my last bat. So I was 0 for 6 off Randy. And he's, he's, he's got great stuff, and he was a great pitch, another Hall of Famer, and should have been a Hall of Famer. Um, but, um, but, I'm, but in terms of just you know, pure you know, pitching and stuff, the guys that gave me the most problems were, were Pedro and, and um, Maddox. And Maddox. You know, as, far as, um, as far as guys to catch, you know, I, I caught some guys that had electric stuff, guys like uh, Matt Morris um, in St. In, uh, St. Louis and, and um, uh, Freddie Garcia, Gil Mesh in Seattle, those two guys. I mean, just electric stuff. Their ball just did all kinds of stuff. Jake Peavy and his ball moved all over the place. And there, there were probably some other guys if I sat back and really – those guys kind of stand out as guys that just really had – probably Morris and – Freddie, Joel Pinheiro had just, I mean, they just had four good pitches. But I'll tell you, the best pitcher, raw, pure pitcher that I ever caught, I have to say, was Jamie Moyer. Jamie Moyer. Yeah. I mean, getting guys out, throwing 88 miles an hour with his stuff, and then later in his career, I don't even think he threw that hard. But he located, his ball moved all over the place. He had good command. He had a, I had a good idea what he was doing. He, he, mentally, he was tough on the mound. He, he just, he had every good quality of a, of a Pedro Martinez. He just didn't have the stuff. Didn't have a hundred. But he, he didn't have a hundred. But he could locate. I mean, yeah. he won, he won twenty games in his career. He pitched into his fifties. I mean, he was effective. Yeah, yeah. You know, he got guys out. Guys got themselves out. Guys would get so frustrated when he would get them out. And I get it. I mean, I, I understand that. But I'll tell you, his ball moves so much that guys would give up on pitches. I mean, if you think about it, when you know, when, when the ball leaves a pitcher's hand, if you don't see the the ball come out of his hand and all you're doing is picking up the ball and the spin on the ball, you you're 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 almost going, okay, if it if it leaves at a high trajectory, it's a ball. Right, and if it leaves coming at me, it's a ball. Mm-hmm. And if it leaves his hand going outside, it's a ball. But his his ball would come back onto the plate or come down into the strike zone, and after you've already given up on it, and that was what made him so effective is his ball moves so much, you know. Um, and it, he, he his routine was his pregame routine was good. He was um, very mechanical, very solid, and it was fun to catch. He was fun to catch. It was always fun to catch. So back then, um, how much of the game were you calling yourself versus a pitcher calling their own game? So, um, well, back there, first of all, the catchers called the whole game. Um, and, and I would say as, as heady as Jamie was and as much in control as Jamie was, um, and, and there was a plan that we came up with before the game that we would, that we would, that we would take into the game. I, I like to say the before the game, we would formulate a plan, right? You have your pitching coaches, your pitcher, um, your catchers, and sometimes during the group meetings, but you would formulate a plan in those meetings. And then it was my job to implement that plan mm-hmm. in the games. And then it was his job to execute it. Yeah. So if Jamie, since we're talking about him, if, J- if Jamie had an idea what he was going to do, but I had a good idea what he wanted to do mm-hmm. from the times that we talked. And we spent a lot of times in the clubhouse, a lot of times in restaurants, a lot of times on the plane talking about these types of things, right? And I did with all pitchers, not just him. 
So you start to try to get an idea of what he wants to do so he's not shaking you off all the time. Mm -hmm. You know what the plan is. If I throw a fastball in here and, and you execute that, okay, well, we know we, we can throw next. Um, if we throw a, a you know a, a sinker and he pulls it foul, well, okay, we know we know what we've got next. Right. Um, if he misses with a location, okay, well, we need to come back with a strike pitch. Okay, this is what I think you should throw here. So there might have been a time he might have changed me, you know, shook me off there. But for the most part, um, it's a plan that we'd come up with before the game. Ultimately, the ball's in his hands. So right. He's going to be the one that makes the decision. But I think a lot of the times. Um, it was my goal to try to get the pitcher to have so much confidence in me that I wasn't just throwing fingers down. I, right. I don't remember a lot of times that I would just put a finger down and put it down. I mean, there was always a reason that I had to do yeah. that. Sometimes it was wrong, but most of the time it was based on, you know, hours of video that I watched. You know, um, it was based on what my pitcher's strengths were. You know, always try to throw to your pitcher's strengths first, I did. Um, what gave him the best chance to succeed. The, those were all things that would go into why you would call a certain pitch, which is, in my opinion, tough to do from the side. You know, I, I, it baffles me how that's happening right now. I, I don't understand that, that. And I haven't been able to find anybody that's been able to explain that to me. Why? Can you go more into that? I don't understand how you can call a game from the side of the dugout, from in the dugout. Like the manager? Anybody that's not right behind, yeah, yeah. I, I just don't, I don't know how that happens. Managers don't call it. Managers, it's either the pitching coach or somebody else that's calling it. The manager's got other things to worry about, which is why the catcher's supposed to call or call the game when I was there. I mean, now, I get, I get that there are some catchers that didn't get into that part of the game like me. I, I get that there were some guys that that didn't care as much about that. Maybe they didn't need to. They probably didn't need to. I mean, I, there were really good hitting catchers that I played against that probably didn't care as much. Um, but that just means that the pitcher has to shoulder a little bit more of that, right? And the, and the, and the pitching coach in the meetings, they got to come up with a little bit better plan. Um, but I, I just don't – I mean, there's so much that goes on from pitch to pitch with a hitter and how he reacts to pitches right. that – if. If you don't, if you don't see that, I, I mean, I, I, there are. I'll give you an example. There are so many. I don't watch a lot of baseball right now, but I have seen some games, and there's a there's a lot of um, guys hitting breaking balls right now, a lot, and they're sitting on them, and they're sitting on them. Either they know they're going to get them at some point, or they're they know when it's coming, or something. Otherwise, they'd be getting fooled by some of the ones that they're hitting. Yeah. So. I, I, I guess I'm just as a, as a as a catcher. I, if I, I'm not going to call a breaking ball unless I feel like the breaking ball is that pitch. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't. I don't know what all the schematics and tables and all the stuff that they're doing right now is. And maybe there's maybe that there's there's good basis for doing that. I, I don't know. I'm sure there is. That's why they're doing it. I just I haven't heard what it is. And I, I just can't believe that somebody can sit there and call a better game from the side than you can from behind the plate. Maybe they got monitors in the dugouts. Maybe they can see locations and stuff. I, I and, don't know. And, yeah, it might be like analysis, analysis paralysis nowadays because there's so much information that teams have and with spin rates and, you know, all these different things, sequencing. Um, like, for example, Andres Munoz, he's on the Seattle Mariners right now. He's an elite relief pitcher. His fastball is like 101, and then he's got a 90-mile-an-hour slider. Those are really his two pitches. He's, he's got a sinker, too. But he's throwing his slider 60% of the time, and that's good and bad. Last year it worked for him because he's got 101 that the batter knows that they have to cheat on in order to hit that. Mm -hmm. So they were swinging through the slider all last year. This year it started off being the same usage, but then you know they're starting to piece up the slider because they're sitting on the breaking ball, kind of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And now you know I talked to him on the sideline, and he's throwing the fastball more because mm – -hmm. Now the guys are sitting on the slider because they know that he throws it more. Yeah. But when he can just blow one on one by you, so, so it's it's a yeah mind game going both ways, I guess. Yeah, and, and I and <clears throat> I don't know all the technologies that they have now, so I I, I, I probably shouldn't um, you know rush to, to judge. Oh, I'm sure they're doing it for a reason. But if you, if you watch hitters today, like on when I'm watching games on TV, you can tell what they're sitting on. 
you know, you can watch by the way they react to certain pitches. I mean, if a hitter takes a, you know, a, a titter, hitter takes a 1-1 fastball right down the middle of the plate, I don't care how fast it is, 90, 100, it doesn't matter. If he takes a fastball, he's not sitting on it. Mm -hmm. he's, he was waiting for something else because you can't. Like you said earlier, if a guy's throwing 95 plus, you have to cheat to get the head out. Yeah. So if I'm sitting on a fastball in a fastball count and I'm sitting on a fastball and I get a breaking ball that breaks down, I'm either going to try to check my swing late or I'm going to swing and miss it. Right. Or I'm going to get way out in front and I might yeah. get lucky to you know get the head on it. But if I'm sitting on a breaking ball and I get a fastball, I, I won't even get the bat off my shoulder. Right. So, but if you watch these guys, you'll see that. Most, guy, most guys will not adjust pitch to pitch. Most guys will adjust at bat to at bat or game to game. But you'll, you can tell that, too, if you watch video of a guy. So if I got a guy that, let's say, a, a four-hole hitter in a lineup, if I'm going to go in and, and if we play them next week, I'm going to watch his last 30, 40 at-bats. And I'm going to watch who he's facing, how, what, 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 what pitches he's swinging at, and what counts he's swinging at him. Is he pulling the ball or is he hitting the ball the other way? You know, is he susceptible to anything hard and high here? Is he swinging at breaking balls in the dirt? What what is her what are his tendencies? He's going to do what got him there. That's that's the way he hits. Right. And he's going to continue to hit that way because that's what got him there. Right. Mm -hmm. It'd be stupid for him to do anything else. He's relying on the pitcher to make a mistake that he can hit. Ninety nine percent of guys are like that. So if I can try to figure out what his pattern is, then I can call my game around that. Right. Guys throw harder nowadays, the majority of guys? Yeah, they do. But, I mean, if, if you're sitting on a heater and it's 103 and you're sitting on it and it's a pitch out over the plate, you can hit it. You can hit it. Most guys are going to hit that pitch out of the park. You just see the white blur. This yeah, I mean, but you, I mean, you just you get, you get accustomed to seeing the ball come in at you that, yeah, that fast. Yeah. You just do. <clears throat> so you, you, you have to keep guys off balance somehow. Some guys are going to, like, if, if you get a guy that throws a breaking ball 60% of the time and you see three pitches, chances are one of them is going to be a breaking ball, right? I mean, that's the percentages on that. If you see four or five pitches because he's not throwing them for strikes, if that's the pitch he's throwing the majority of the time, that's the pitch he's trying to get a strike with. If he's trying to get a strike with it, most of the time it's a called strike. It's not a swing and a miss strike unless it's in a swing and a miss situation, right, like an 0-2 or something. So an 0-0, a 1-1, a 2-1. A two zero. If he is going to throw that breaking ball, he's going to he's got to throw it for a called strike, mm -hmm. right? So, if if a guy is up there sitting on a, if he hits a two zero breaking ball, if you throw a ninety mile an hour slider and the guy hits it, he's sitting on it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's the way it is. So either he's always sitting on it, or he was sitting on it on that pitch. So those are the types of things that you would you would look at and you go, okay. And I would look at because we didn't have the analysis that they have today. We would watch it. And say, okay, well, he didn't do that yesterday. He didn't do that the day before. He didn't do it this way. So maybe he's maybe it's just this guy. Maybe he he knows our pitcher's going to throw a lot of breaking balls, so he's just going to sit up there and sit on it. Yeah. So I say we get in a situation. Let's pump a heater in there and see if he swings at it. If he takes a two zero heater down the middle, he's sitting on a breaking ball. Yeah. You know, and and th there's a lot of that that goes in the game. If you can tell that from the side now. They got different stuff than they had when I was there because it's that's hard to do from the side. Real hard, especially in stadiums where the dugouts are way down the line. I mean, yeah, <laughs> like Boston, you know, some of those places you can't. You, you, I don't know if L L.A. used to be like that, Dodger Stadium. I don't know if it is anymore, but there's a half a mile to get to the plate. You couldn't see anything <laughs> from there, let alone, you know, see what the, you know, the ball, see what the pitcher was doing. You're looking at him from the side. But anyway, that's, that's a whole nother, yeah, that, those are whole other issues that, that's that's the fun part about baseball that I I kind of miss and I when I watch games I I probably do that more than my wife wants to hear if I sit there and talk about <laughs> stuff like that but um, but I do miss that I miss I miss the guys and I miss stuff like that but the the grind yeah I don't, I'm not missing that part yeah so yeah I mean 13 years that you were in the big leagues um, so yeah I guess. Um, like thinking to current day, the game, we kind of talked about some of the differences from when you were playing to now. Faster fastballs, you're saying. Um, what else do you see right now that's different from when you were playing? 
<clears throat> yeah, I think um, I think typically guys are throwing harder. I, I would say the average the average pitcher's fastball is harder than what it was when I was playing. Um, but there's a lot of differences. Uh, you know, pitchers aren't are not throwing as much. You know, are we going to see any twenty game winners anymore? You know, I I don't know. Not with not with all the you know the specialized roles. And that started when I was playing. I'm not saying that it didn't, but there were twenty game winners. You know, back then there were Shillings and Clemens and you know Moyers. These guys threw two hundred you know two hundred fifty innings. Yeah. You know, um, I, I mean, is all of a sudden it worse right now than it? I mean, you don't want to. I understand pitch counts. I'm all for pitch counts, especially in young kids in high mm-hmm. school and college. I'm all for that, but. Some of these guys, you know, I remember Roger Clements. I mean, he was a horse. He he wanted. I didn't. I, I played against him, but he wanted the ball in the eighth and ninth inning. He didn't want to come out. Like Nolan Ryan, there's another one. Yeah, man. he wasn't coming out of the game. He's gonna throw 250, 200, you know, 150 pitches. That's the way he was. Yeah, and he was accustomed to doing that. And as far as I know, he's he's not hurting right now. You know, he's 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 still healthy. And you know, some of these guys that are. I, I don't know, but but I but I understand the specialized roles. I'm not saying that there's not a place for that because I believe there is, and I think that the game does get specialized, and I'm fine with that. Um, but it's definitely different. Um, I, I would say that um, the guys. I, I would say that the guys are very athletic now. Maybe maybe bigger and stronger and faster than they were when I was playing. Um, you know, I there were some pretty big and strong and fast guys when I was playing too. Um, maybe maybe there's just more of them now. You know, um, and and they you know they hit the ball long ways, and you know the guys are making still making great plays, and you know I think the talent is 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 definitely still there. Um, I I don't know if I think the game is played a little bit differently. You know, now I I don't recall guys um, flipping bats in the air and. Um, <laughs> I, there know. might have been more that went that was allowed back in the day, you know, like the yelling matches and the brawls that you guys had versus now things are, uh, I feel like, more rules, you could say. Um, so they don't... There are bat, bat flipping now, which it sounds like there wasn't back in the day, but you might have been... Not yeah, a lot. Yeah, you might have been all able to... Was it more chippy back in the day? I don't remember it being like that. Because guys would, or was there the mutual respect where you just was, wouldn't show off? I, I I don't I can't say that there's not mutual respect right now, right. but I would say that there definitely was back then. You didn't do that, you know. And the the epitome of the home run guy was Matt Williams. You watch Matt Williams hit a homer, and that's that's what it, when I played in San Francisco, that's what that's what you want to do. You want to hit a home run. You want to act like Matt Williams. You know, you want to run around the bases. You want to get in the dugout celebrate with your guys and that was it you know there wasn't a there wasn't a triton or a staff or, you know a chair <laughs> the home run celebrations you know, that every team has now yeah you know you don't yeah. put on a mask or a cape or you just didn't do that you know <laughs> yeah I, yeah I, I guess it's part of the game now you know i i, I would have a very difficult time putting a, a mask or a cape on or sitting in a big chair or putting a big gold thing on it <laughs> i don't know maybe i would i i just have a i i just i just don't I just don't see myself doing that. I don't see anybody that I played with doing that. But but then again, that's that's one of the differences in the game, you know. And, uh, and one of the sayings now is let the kids play. So um, that might be part of it, and it's just showing personality and a lot more of that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. There's an argument for that, I guess. You know, I you know I played with uh, I played with guys that I thought had a lot of personality, but. <laughs> you know, that didn't do that, but I, but I, I understand that. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not here to, you know, to get on the way they're playing the game now. Those guys are, I mean, they're incredible, you know, skilled athletes and players and I enjoy watching the things that they can do. I just, I just didn't celebrate the way they did, I guess. For sure. Um, so now post major league baseball, um, what are you up to now? It sounds like you're coaching with a high school I did, yeah. From I think from about '07 to about 2014 or 15, I was at Union High School. Okay. Um, that was a new high school at the time, so that was a that was a fun program to start, and you know we had some good kids come through there. My son came through there. Clint Coulter. Clint Coulter was there, and um, I remember yeah. pitching against him. I went to Skyview yeah. High School. Oh, okay. 2009 to 2012. Oh, okay. And, and 2012, I was actually our closer, so I 
pitched against Clinton oh, a few yeah. times. Yeah. And it's like, it's, and then also Ian Hamilton mm-hmm. with Skyview. He's a relief pitcher for the Yankees yeah, now. Yeah, he's still playing. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, you know, being on his team, but it's, there's certain guys to where they're just bigger, stronger, faster than everybody. And then yeah. here am I, you know, trying to go and get, go against these guys. It's just a, a different level. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I remember Clint. Every time he'd make contact, he would grunt super loud, and it would yeah. probably go 450 feet. Yeah, I remember <laughs> that. Yeah, he was a special player. Um, you know, the Wayland boys were good. There, there were there were a lot of good players that came through there. I mean, I think one year we put nine guys in college baseball from that from from Union's team. There were some good players. There was good high Aust- school players. Austin Barr at Camus my senior year. He went yeah. on to play at Stanford for a little bit. Yeah, and then there was another uh, kid. It was it Zach? Um, what was his name? Taylor? Zach? Zach Taylor? Something Taylor? Doesn't ring a bell. Zach Taylor. But... He, I think he's in the big leagues right now. Somebody. Is he? Yeah, he was a hard throwing right hander um, starter. Taylor. I think his name was Zach Taylor. There was also another. Um, I'm trying to think of his name from Skyview. He was a righty. He went to the Rays. For a little bit, he was in the minor league system. Um, Jeff Ames. Mm-hmm. Jeff yep. Ames. I remember Ames, yep. Yeah, he was good. Yeah, there were, there were some good players in this area. There was a kid from Skyview that, um, or uh, not Skyview, Heritage, that ended up um, um, doing a little bit too. Um, I can't remember. I can't remember his name. Are you involved currently with any uh, no. coaching or? No, I, I still keep in contact with some of the guys at Union because I know some of the guys that were there that, that are still there. And I mean, Lee Hunter is the head coach there now. And his, his brother, Brian, I played with and played against in the big leagues. Good kid. Um, and then there's uh, some other guys that are still involved up there that I that I knew that I still talk to. But um, from a baseball standpoint, no. No, I got uh, when Thomas graduated, uh, he went to college and played. He played a couple years at Mount Hood, then a couple years at LC State. So I kind of followed him, and then when he got done, uh, I got into uh, I got my general contractor's license. So I did a little bit of remodeling and things, and I and I love that. Uh, but I just uh, I got out of that about four years ago, and I got into cows and horses and trying to do some a little bit of farming and uh, driving, bringing hay back and forth from Central Oregon. I love doing that and. Yeah, just I just love that whole environment. I could have been a farmer. I think my yeah. whole life I could have. I I love it. I love that. That keeps me busy now. Cool. So you don't watch much Major League Baseball currently? No, I don't. Um, I maybe my my son in law, uh, both my son in laws watch a lot. One's a huge Giants fan, and one's a just a baseball fan in general, and. Um, so they have games on usually when we're over there. And so I, I actually watched more baseball in these last couple of years than I have in the last mm-hmm. 20. But These next few weeks will be a fun time to watch the Mariners. I don't know if you were a Mariner fan growing up. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was when I got to Seattle. They well, they started in 77, so I was there. Yep. We moved there in 72. It was the Pilots. The Pilots, then... yep, yep. They played at Old Six Stadium and yep. then uh, – and then the Mariners in the Kingdom, and when I was a Bat Boy, that that was the Mariners. The Mariners were um, were just starting then. Eighty well, they, seventy-seven, I think, was their first year. But right. I think I was there in seventy-nine or eighty. It was funny because Dave Henderson was a good friend of mine. Uh, it, later in life, after baseball, you know, before he passed away, when he was with the Mariners, and then we used to snowmobile together and super guy. And then Dave Haverlow, who who is still, um, he's over in the uh, Moses Lake area. He still does some radio and stuff i think for central washington i still talk to him uh, julio cruz those guys were on that team that i worked you know <laughs> that i worked for so um so it's kind of cool I, I still talk to some of the guys um around around here and that are you know old mariners guys that are around here but that's awesome um, yeah yeah so i guess what advice would you have for a young player that's looking to come up and go somewhere with their career well i i would first of all i i would say i mean if if, if it's something that you really want to do i I, w- I would just say you know don't don't let anybody tell you you can't do anything you know i mean i was just a small skinny kid from you know from bellevue that made it you know and and at, at the time i i didn't i didn't know i just i knew that's what i wanted to do and my parents gave me every opportunity to do it you know and um 
so I think it's important as parents, you know, that we encourage our kids to do, you know, to do those things. But, um, you know, I, I would just tell kids to, you know, you, you, it, it, it's practice, right? It's a, it's a lot of practice. There's a lot more distractions now than there were when I was playing. I get that when I was growing up. Um, but if you really want, if you really want to do something and, and you listen to people that have gotten there and, and how they did it and, you know, maybe take some of that, you know, take some of the advice from people that were there. You know, it, you, if you want to play ba- if you want to play any sport, you got to get outside and play it. You, you can't do it inside. Right. You know, on watching television, you just can't. I mean, you can learn a lot, but you got to play the sport. Mm-hmm. You got to practice the sport. You got to train for the sport. There are not a lot of guys, and I played with 13 years, 17 years, I think I played, and I don't know how many thousands of guys I played with. I mean, other than Ken Griffey, I can't remember anybody that could just roll off the couch and be good. Yeah. You know, even even the big boys, they worked hard at it. And I'm not saying Junior didn't work hard. He could just roll off the couch and be good. And he was. But, but – you, you got to work at it, you know? I mean, and, and there's a lot of kids that do. There's a lot of specialized programs out there, you know, even in Vancouver. You know, there's a lot of them. And get them involved. And I mean, if they want to play multiple sports, I don't think there's a problem with that, you know? Teaching kids to be good athletes is important, mm-hmm. you know? I know that, you know, college coaches and, and pro scouts are looking for athletes. They want athletes, you know? Now, granted, you know, if you got a pitcher that's, you know, pitching his whole life and that's that's a different my pitchers are a different animal anyway but but um yeah my, my advice would be just to you know get involved with as many people that I, I tell people that I think one of the reasons that that I was a, that I could be a good a good coach as I you know up through the ranks is because you know I played at the at the highest level that there was so I know what it takes to get there and I, I think a good a good high school coach, if he played in college, knows what it takes to get his kids from high school to college. And and same thing from college to pro ball. You know, if you if you don't know what it's like to play every day, it's hard to teach a guy in college to play every day. You know what I mean? Yeah. Unless you've actually been there to do that. So seek out people that have done what you've done at the level that you want to get to. Mm-hmm. And, you know... Take it. Take as much advice as you can. If if you use what you can, you keep it in there. You what you don't use goes out the other ear. Get get as much advice as you can on how people did it and 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 work at it. But I mean, there's no reason. You, you, we don't know what's going to happen in our lifetimes. You know, you don't know when you're going to stop growing, when you're going to stop throwing hard, when you're going to stop. You know, we don't, we just don't know that. You know, so if it's in your your heart to do it, put the work in and do it. Because uh, I'll tell you, it's a you know, Major League Baseball, if that's a dream of yours, it's a, it's a great lifestyle, you know, and it's a, it provided, you know, me with everything that I needed for my family, you know, and, and I, you know, I just, I'm, I'm so grateful for that opportunity that I had the opportunity to do it, but I wouldn't have been able to do it if I didn't, you know, put my mind to, to do it and, and put everything I had into those, you know, the eggs in that basket and, and go for it. And that's what I did. And that's what, you know, so for me, it worked out. Some people it doesn't, but you know, every, you talk to almost everybody that did it like that, and that's what they're going to tell you. So that that's a component that I think is necessary for people that end up getting to that level. Yeah, put all doubt aside and just go for it. Yeah. And baseball is a game of failure, so the and also the sooner you can learn how to deal with that failure, yeah. then that just allows you to to potentially get to that next spot. Yeah, and 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 that doesn't mean that you have to, you know, accept that you're going to be bad. That just means that you got to learn how to motivate yourself to get better. You know, while you're failing, I mean, failing isn't failing unless you fail. You keep failing at it. Failure is a success if you learn from it, right? I mean, that's just the way you learn. It's like doing a math problem. If you get it wrong and the teacher shows you how to do it, you're not going to quit doing math, right? Right. I mean, you're going to learn, learn from it. Learn from it. You know, now all of a sudden, that, that's how you learn. We learn a lot of the times in the greatest times in our lives mm-hmm. is when you know bad things happen to us. Right. That's when we learn the most. I said it earlier today, we did a podcast before this, but the proper stress creates growth. If you take stress and, you know, use it in a, in a bad way, then it's going to hurt you. But if you put it, if you have the proper stress, then you'll get better from it. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree with that. I agree with that. And then Deion Sanders, uh, I think it was this this last week he was asked what was the hardest thing that he's done in, in his career 
playing football, coaching, or hitting a baseball. And he said, by far, hitting a baseball. Because yeah. you succeed three times out of ten, you're probably an all-star or a Hall of Famer. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and he was, uh, he was a special guy. Um, he was a special player. I mean, I, you know, I, I watched him play football, and but I got to play with him and watch that guy run around the bases was, it was, it was just another level. I mean, it's just, just oh, it's, it's unbelievable watching him run. It was, you know, God, what an athlete. I mean, and what a guy, I'll tell you. Yeah. I remember when I retired and, and that was it actually was even after the season, but one of the one of the questions that a lot of people ask me is is what what he was like, and I'll, I'll tell you, he was one of the most genuine, you know, fun loving, hard working, best guys you could ever ever ask for as a teammate. He was a great teammate. I had great teammates, some great teammates, and I would put him right up there with some of the best teammates I ever. had. He was great. That's awesome off the field, on the field. He was an encourager. He was positive. He was, he, he was just, he was just everything you want in a teammate. I remember when we were in, um, we went into, in 95, we went into Cincinnati to play the Reds and it was right before the, the, he was going to get traded and, uh, Paul O'Neill or Hal Morris, one of those two guys, I can't remember. They might have been both together. They came, we were talking to him before the game, stretching. And everybody knew he was going to get traded to the Giants. <clears throat> and that was the word. And uh, they're like, dude, wait till, wait till you get this guy on your team. You're going to love him. You know, you're going to love him. Mm-hmm. And I liked him when he was playing football. So, I mean, I thought he was funny. You know, he, he always made me laugh. He's one of those guys back in the day with a personality kind of like today, right? Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was, he was, he was, but there was always something I, when, when you, I don't know, when I heard him interviewed, I, I guess I just, I always liked what he had to say. I mean, I always, he seemed like a, he seemed like a, like Dean and, and, and I, and I talked to him about this later. And so he, he would, he, this is what he said is prime, Prime time was a different guy. Yeah, you know, Deion Sanders is is Deion Sanders was a great guy. Prime time was his was what he was like when he was on the alter field, ego. You know, yeah, in a I, way. yeah. I hate to to call it that because he might not call it that, but that's what it was. You yeah, know? and when it was time to turn on the lights, that's what he did. You know, and that's the way he did it. And that's what he's doing now. He's always done it mm-hmm. like that. But I remember Paul and, 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 and Hal saying to me, you're going to love this guy. And I remember when he came into the clubhouse in, in San Francisco and, and Dusty Baker was our manager and Bake came out and he said, um, you know, hey, <clears throat> was he had a team meeting before we went out and stretched. He said, hey, just wanted to call you guys together. Um, you, know, you know, we got Deion Sanders from Cincinnati and he wanted to say a few things to the team and he got up and said something to the team. No. This was Barry's team. Okay. Barry was the guy. And and Barry was not quite as um he he was he had a different personality than Dion, let's just say. <laughs> and um I remember Dion got up there and was like, you know, hey, just wanted to let you guys know what an honor it is for me to be with you guys and we were just like you know, what, you know, what, can't, this, we Not, didn't even, it shocked yeah. everybody. You know, if there's anything I can do for anybody to help, you just, just let me know. I'm here for you guys and all this. And it was, it's pretty cool to hear a, a mega star. He was beyond a baseball star. He was, he was big in everything, you know, to be able to come out and say this. And there were, there were times during that season that he showed me personally that he was genuine, you know, and I, and I'll never forget that some of the things that he said to me and I always I always d- defend him to people that don't like what he represents because they don't know him you know if, if in, 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 there was something that came out the other day it was an article in fact I sent it to my son because I wanted him to read it it was all some players like Smoltz and guys that had played with him that just talked about what he was like as a teammate he's like he's he was electric I'm telling you and what he's doing for college football right now is outstanding. I love it. Mm-hmm. I love it. I hope they win every game. I don't think they're going to win every game, but I hope they win every game. 
I believe they believe they're going to win every game, which is good. I believe that um, Dion is doing what he believes he should be doing, and that is mentoring to a bunch of guys in Colorado right now that I believe he, he thinks that's his place, and I believe that's his place. And I don't think there's any amount of money that's going to get him to go to the NFL. I don't think he cares about the money. I think he cares about doing what he feels he's supposed to be doing, and that is mentoring young kids right. to be responsible, accountable young men that can make a difference in children's and people's lives. That's what he's doing. Right. And he is always been a winner. He's going to be a winner at this. I think this will – he's already been successful with what he's done. He did it at Jackson. He's going to do it here. And if there's another program, they talk about him moving to a bigger power five. Uh, I'm telling you, the if he goes anywhere, it's going to have to be – a program that does what he wants to do that is going to let him bring his way of doing things in mm -hmm. and, and their, their, their philosophy is going to have to line up or he won't go there for any amount of money. Right. Cause he believes what he's doing right now for these kids. And I believe what he's doing for the kids. I think he's changing college football, maybe by the way he's doing it. And I think that's great, but I think what he's, the impact he's having on these kids is even better. And, and so I, I, if I ever get the chance to talk to him, that's what I would encourage him to do and just keep doing that. You know, because I, 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 and the world has been waiting. And then there's guys out there like that. I'm not saying that he's the only guy. He's just getting a lot of attention because of his personality. He's getting a lot of attention for that right now. And I'm just, I'm so thankful that he's in that position. He's using the platform that God gave him to do what he's called to do. And I'm, I'm just so excited he's doing it. Yeah. And he has said that, you know, it's hard to motivate guys that are collecting these giant paychecks versus, you know, the college athlete that is. Yeah, you can actually make an impact on yeah in their life. Yeah, and 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 you know, Dion made an impact on a lot of guys when he was playing, and I believe I believe that he could do that as a professional coach, but not at the not at the scale. It's just it's pro sports and college sports, at least for now, are still a little bit different, right? Even though guys are getting some NIL money and stuff. Yeah, the 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 average it's, college it's, athlete. The heard. average college athlete is there because Dion's there, right? And the pro athletes are there because that's what you do to make money. And right. The coaches, the managers, just there. There's people are following Dion there, for you know, sure. And I think it's great. I know if I had a son that had an opportunity to choose a program that he was coaching and somebody else was coaching, and I could give him and have Dion's influence in that in my son's life for. 10 hours a day, nine months out of the year that I can't be there. I, I want him. I want that Dion to be his influence. And that's, those are the types of guys he's getting those guys. And he is, he's, he's, he speaks the truth and he is going to get through to kids. And uh, I, I just, I think it's great. I hope that more athletes, guys that played have an opportunity to get into the game. And especially at that, not quite professional level yet and, and have an impact on kids for greater than just sports and winning sports. Because like all the commercials say, the majority of these kids are not going to play professional baseball they're, or football. They're going to go do something else. Right. They, they, they're going to have a lot more coming at them, you know, so use that opportunity of sports to learn, to, to you know, prepare yourself for getting out of the, you know, getting into the real world, so to speak, because, that's where the majority of these people are going to be. And that speaks to how many people transferred to Colorado when he moved there. And then also I've heard like multiple stories of, you know, kids going through tough situations at home to where Dion took them in and gave them an opportunity and like was that father figure for them when, mm -hmm. when they didn't have that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I don't know what all the statistics are and I don't want to start throwing a bunch of them out, but there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of problems with people that grow up without male role models in their lives. And coaches can be those guys, you know, um, they can be those mentors and not, not that they try to do it necessarily, but they can be that guy. And I, Dion likes that. That's what he, he believes that's one of his responsibilities. And I believe that's one of his responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And I think he can impart some great things on these kids, you know, and I bet he already has. 
and there's other guys out there that 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 can do that too. And I hope I, I really hope that you know not only do, does Dion continue to do this, but that this this kind of motivates and propels other athletes that are in similar situations to his to get involved and to do that because man it, it you know culture we we see you know we see culture today and you know i i mean i believe that there's you know there's children out there that really could have benefited from having a good solid family structure and father you know and yeah. I, I know coaches can provide that sometimes absolutely well, Tom, I really appreciate your time. It's been yep. awesome getting to know you a little bit, hear your story, and looking forward to the next conversation that we'll have. Well, thank you. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thanks. Awesome.